Hello again, everybody. This is Pastor Tony welcoming you to lesson number five of the third series in our Healing 101 course. For these next two lessons, we're going to really focus in on our twofold redemption that God the Father carried out through His Son in His death, burial, and resurrection. And as the title of this series, this whole series indicates, it is a finished work. It was a complete, perfect, and a finished work that God carried out through Jesus on the cross, in his burial, and in his resurrection and ultimate ascension back into heaven. Now I know a lot of religious traditional ideas and teachings, and I've heard these things, really kind of compartmentalize our salvation, our redemption, and really almost make it one-dimensional. And they basically just focus on, you know, just the new birth experience and then everything else we just have to wait till we get to heaven someday in the sweet by and by. And while I will agree that the spirit is the most important thing, because, you know, if you got healed in your physical body and never received Jesus as Lord of your life, never were born again, became a new creation, then what good is that? I mean, really, you need to be born again. The real part of us, the eternal part of us, is our spirit. So I can't uh, disagree with that right there, that that should be the emphasis, but not at the point of just saying, well, the rest of it doesn't matter, and the rest of it, we're going to have to wait till we get to heaven. Because when you look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, you see that he spent a lot of time dealing with the physical body, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease from great multitudes of people while he was here on the earth. So if it was that important that Jesus carried that out in his earthly ministry, it must be important for us today. You know, and I believe because we have compartmentalized and really made this whole salvation experience one-dimensional and really shoved the rest of it off into the future, that it really has no bearing a lot of times on the present day needs that we have. And that's the reason a lot of times that the church and its message, its modern day message rooted in religion, not in the word of God, has become irrelevant and powerless. And that's why the church is basically considered sometimes a non-essential rather than an essential part of our society. But you know, God created us as a three-part being. And I have, you know, some teachings on this online audio and on this YouTube channel that uh, deal with the three parts of a man's being, spirit, soul, and body. I think we call it uh, Three's Company or something like that. It'll enlighten you, and I tell you, it's a real important thing that we understand man on three parts, spirit, soul, and body. That's the way God created us. That's the way God created all of us. First of all, the eternal part is the spirit. That's the one part that's created in the likeness and the image of God. We have a soul, our mind, will, and emotions, but we also live in a physical body. It's sometimes a lot of the uh, convenient religious traditional teachings I've heard just kind of basically just shove off and just basically uh, make us think that the physical body is just nothing but evil and God doesn't care anything at all about it. Well, first of all, why did God create a physical body for us to live in? And second of all, why did Jesus spend so much time on the earth dealing with healing in physical bodies? No, those things are important to God. Now, we all do understand that our physical bodies uh, have not yet changed into that glorified state that we will have one day in the future. But that doesn't mean that God didn't make provision for our healing and for our wholeness in our physical bodies now. God intends for us to finish our course. And in order to finish our course here on the earth and do what he wants us to do, we're going to have to live in a, in a physical house, a physical body that's uh, not, you know, all racked with pain all the time and falling apart, God wants us to finish our race with joy, take a, a victory lap, to be like Moses. Moses, under a lesser and an inferior covenant, he lived to be 120 years old. The Bible says his eyes did not grow dim, nor his natural forces and strength abated with that age. And when it time it came time for him to go home, God made him climb, climb a mountain to go to his own funeral. <laughs> So God wants to satisfy us with long life, long, strong life. Now that, you know, the, the amount, we may spend some time on this down the road in long life and God satisfying us with length of days, 
God's made provision for that, but that's all relative to what you consider to be satisfaction. Nobody wants to live uh, forever down here on, in this body on this earth. I can tell you right now, once you get a taste of heaven and, and the presence of God over on that side, you don't want to stick around here. But at the same time, we have a job to do. We have a race to run here. God has left us here for a purpose and for a reason. And so let's do that. Let's finish our race with strength, with joy, with a physical body that we have received that, that part of our redemption, that healing in our physical bodies. But I believe over the next couple of lessons, you're going to see abundantly clear from the Word of God that the redemption plan covers both the new birth, the forgiveness of sins in our spirits, but also physical healing in our bodies. So let's look over back to some scripture we've looked at previously in previous lessons in this series. And if you're just now joining us, I encourage you highly to go back and listen to the first, first four lessons before you get to this one because it'll make more sense to you. We've given some commentary that I don't have time to go back and review again. But let's go back over to Isaiah chapter 53 again today. Isaiah chapter 53 and look at some verses of scripture again we've looked at previously in previous lessons in this series. But let's begin reading with verse number three. It talks about Jesus. This is a prophecy of Jesus the Messiah becoming sin for us as our substitute, not because he sinned on his own, but as our substitute, he, he stood in for us, took our place, and became what we were so that we can, in essence, become what he is now. But verse 3, he says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Now he's referring, this prophecy is very detailed, and it's referring to when Jesus actually drank of our bitter cup of sin, identified with mankind in his sin and fallen condition, the, all the way back to the first Adam, and then went to the cross to pay the price and pay our sin debt off so that we can be free from that. So this is what it's describing here in verse three and following. But verse four says, surely, now again, I love that word surely, and I believe he knew, the Holy Spirit knew, even way back when, that healing was going to be kind of a controversial uh, issue and, and physical healing was going to be almost extracted off of the redemption plan of God. So he put that word surely in there so that we would know this is without a doubt. This is not some side issue. This is not some optional equipment that we have in redemption. This is all part and intertwined and integrated in God's redemption plan. See, you, again, you have to think, you know, when, when man sinned, when Adam sinned in the, fir, in, in the first Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden and ate off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil against what God commanded him, that he fell. And that's the first time after that that we see the entrance of sickness, disease, and infirmity in mankind's existence. It was never created before that. God didn't create it on a specific day, look at it and said, boy, that's very good. He didn't look at man's body after he had created it and put some boils and tumors and you know all these other things on the first Adam's body and said, man, that is really good. I'm really, I really love that right there. You don't see sickness and disease until after uh, Adam committed high treason, disobeyed God and ate off of that uh, forbidden tree. No, he left the tree of life, which God commanded him to eat off of freely, ate off the wrong tree. And ever since then, we've had to deal with a lot of different forms of the curse, one of which is sickness, disease, and infirmity. So notice right here that everything that, you know, occurred because of the sin and the fall of man and the curse that we all had to deal with after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden passed down to all of us, has been redeemed and taken care of through this plan of redemption. That's why I call it a finished work, a completed work, because if God didn't deal with it the first time around when Jesus came, when is he going to do that? Because we know that we are going to receive a glorified body. And that glorified body is gonna be just like the Lord Jesus, free of sickness, disease, and infirmity, and aging, and all those things. That's gonna be a great thing, I can tell you. But when is God going to purchase that possession if he didn't do it the first time around? No, Jesus did it all. He did every single bit of it 
in that first time when he came around went to the cross for us and this is what this is describing it said surely and i'm gonna uh we've already gone over these and translated and giving you definitions of a lot of the hebrew words there so i'm just going to go on and translate that read it like it should read in the hebrew so that we can understand it from this perspective and other translations hebrew scholars bring this out now i'm going to read it this way surely he jesus has lifted off of our shoulders and placed on him all of our sicknesses and diseases see that's very specific in what he's talking about the word grieves is sickness and disease jesus took off of our shoulders the burden of sin which included punishment which included sickness disease and infirmity he took that off of our shoulders and put it on his and he has carried off to a distance our pains see pain never was physical pain never was the plan of God for mankind. And I know, so again, a lot of traditional religious ideas give you the idea, no pain, no gain kind of thing, but that is not what, that may be what they say in the gym, and that may be true there, but it's not true here in God training us and deepening our piety, so to speak, and bringing us closer to Him. He doesn't use sickness, disease, and infirmity, and pain, bodily pain, in order to draw us closer to him. No, that, that's not what he's doing. But notice this is what Jesus bore for us on the cross. When he became sin for us, this is what he was bearing for every single one of us. Now why was Jesus bearing it? So that we wouldn't have to bear it. It goes on to say, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now when it says, yet he was esteemed stricken, uh, the Young's literal translation uh, actually translates that word stricken as plagued. So when you hear about plagues going around and epidemics and pandemics, as we've heard recently, notice right there that Jesus has already taken our sicknesses, diseases, pains, and plagues, no matter what they are. He's already taken that for upon himself and bore the, the burden and the price for our redemption from that. See, the word redeem means to purchase freedom through the payment of a price that is what jesus is doing that's what this is describing right here there's no way if you look at this in the hebrew you can get around the fact that this is not talking about sickness disease and infirmity when jesus went to the cross now you know we also read over in matthew's gospel chapter 8 verse 17 the holy spirit actually translates uh and 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 quotes this verse as a legal way for jesus to heal the sick. It says in verse number 17 of Hebrews or, or Matthew 8, it says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So right there, the Holy Spirit in Matthew's gospel actually translates that from Isaiah 53. And I don't see how you can get around that right there because that's what it's saying uh, in the Greek, in the Hebrew and every other way. All right, right here. Now notice he's talking about Jesus healing people under his physical ministry. Now that is very important right there because he's in now including uh, redemption of the physical body, us being redeemed from sickness, disease, and infirmity and plagues under his redemptive work. And he's again just integrating that in there. Let's go back to Isaiah and let's read from verse 5 and 6. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Now those are sins right there. So notice he's at the same time that he is redeeming us from sin and all the effects of the fall of man, he is also integrating sickness, disease, and infirmity because that's part of the fallout of the fall. That's part of the effects, negative evil effects of man's sin, the first Adam's sin that came on upon mankind. And notice that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Something happened to his physical body right here. It's punishment. Now notice that he goes on to say after that, the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Now again, 1 Peter 2, 24, at the very end of that verse, we're gonna look at it in detail later on. It reads this way, by his stripes you were healed. See, Peter's looking back to the finished work of Jesus Isaiah is looking forward in a prophecy to the coming Messiah and what he would suffer for us. 
So notice in verse number six, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Notice the Lord, our heavenly father laid on Jesus the iniquity, all the sins for all mankind on Jesus on the cross. He absorbed all of it. And when he became sin and when those iniquities were placed on him, he fell under our condemning sentence. And he absorbed all the punishment and the wrath of God, the anger of God that was due to us. It was pointed at Jesus, the son on the cross, like a lightning rod, and he just absorbed all of it and drained it all. Every single bit of it, every ounce of the wrath of God, the punishment that was due to us, all that sin debt was paid by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, how could one stand in for everybody, for the many? Because of the value and the worth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross as our substitute and sacrifice to pay the price for our redemption. See, he is the son of God. He is so valuable, he is invaluable. And when you see the value and the worth of Jesus and how he became our substitute and sacrifice, he didn't just barely pay off the sin debt and man, that was it. No, he was a double payment as Isaiah 40 verse two says, he was an overpayment. Now, you know, most people, you know, the church has no problem preaching this part about, you know, the Lord laying on Jesus, the iniquity, the sins of all of us uh, on the cross. They have no problem preaching that. But why don't they preach verse number four that goes along with it, that surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Because at the same time that Jesus was paying the price for sin, he was also eliminating, uprooting, and undoing the works of sin and Satan, which is sickness, disease, and infirmity. Now look at verse number seven. It says, he was oppressed and, and he was afflicted. Yea, he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Now I like the first uh, part of that in the Young's uh, literal translation. I'm just going to read the first uh, sentence of that real quickly in verse number seven. It says, it, has, it hath been exacted, and he has answered. It has been exacted, and he has answered. Now that word exacted there actually means that there was a, a payment come due on the sin debt that all of us were having to pay. Now we got it from uh, you know, the, our original parent, the first Adam, but then all our sins added to it, added to that sin debt. And I tell you, that note came due. That sin de debt was called on mankind when Jesus went to the cross. And none of us could pay it. Our good works couldn't pay it. Our own suffering could not pay it. No, we would have had to go and pay the price in hell for an eternity, that's forever. In other words, we never would have paid it off. But I want you to see that it has been exacted. That payment, that sin debt, that note on sin was called due on the cross. And notice that he has answered. I want you to see that we couldn't answer that. We had nothing to answer that with. But Jesus, when he became sin for us and went to the cross, that sin debt was transferred to his account, just like he owed it himself. And it called on, on a payment for that sin debt while Jesus was on the cross. And notice that Jesus answered it. He is the only one that could answer it. Why? Because he is the only one valuable and worthy enough to actually pay the price for the whole sin debt for all mankind for all time. And that is what that is saying. That is powerful right there. See, there's no reason for the... And see, Satan took advantage of, of that sin condition, of the, con, of the condemning sentence that was on all of us. He took advantage of that sin debt that the first Adam did, that we all added to it, and he used that as leverage to oppress and punish mankind through sickness, disease, and infirmity. It really wasn't God doing it. It was Satan that was doing that. That's why it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. See, that note was, was, it was hanging out there until Jesus the Messiah 
the lamb slain from the foundation would come in the flesh and go to the cross and become sin for all of us and pay that price. But Satan was using that as a leverage to oppress mankind, to bring sickness, disease, and infirmity. So when Jesus dealt with the root sickness, or which was sin, the sin of man, the fall of man, that sin debt, he also dealt with the fruits of it, which were all the curse. That would include sickness, disease, and infirmity, poverty, lack, all other forms of oppression that Satan has used to browbeat man and keep him under his thumb all these years. See, he who the sun sets free, John 8 says, is free indeed. That means every part of every part of our life is free. Not just one little compartmental, one dimensional part, the whole thing, our whole being was set free when Jesus dealt with that root of sin once and once for all on the cross. That is what he's describing here in Isaiah chapter 53. Now, real quickly, verse 10, it says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That word bruise means to break into pieces and to crush. We've already pointed that out. Now, why was it, why did it please the Lord to bruise him, his son? Because then we wouldn't have to go to that same place and be punished and try to exact that through an eternity of punishment in hell. And it says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Boy, that's good news. See, we're all set free right there because of what Jesus did for us. Now, this is not the only place where it integrates and intertwines the forgiveness of sins and the healing of our sickness, diseases, and infirmities. We're there in the Old Testament. Let's go over to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. We're going to look at a number of scriptures over the next couple of days that are going to really bring this out, I believe. But Psalm 103 in verse number 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. See, not compartmentalize one dimensional part or benefit. He said, forget not all of his benefits, plural. Then verse three says, who forgives all of your iniquities? Well, we don't have any problem with that, do we, in the, in the body of Christ? Who forgives all of your iniquities and who heals all of your diseases? Notice that is in the same verse, in the same breath, that the forgiveness of all our iniquities and the healing of all of our diseases are all measured in that finished work of Jesus on the cross. Then in verse 4 it says, who redeems your life from destruction. See, that's what he's doing right there on the cross. He's redeeming our life from destruction. Spirit, soul, body, financially, and every other way. Family. He says, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We already referred to the Lord satisfying us with long life. Well, that's what he's saying right there. Even our youth can be renewed like the eagles when we receive and stand on this redemptive, completed work of God in Christ. Now, skip on down to verse number eight. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. We've seen other scriptures in the last uh, series on this that pointed that out. That's, this is his nature right here. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. Not quick. He's not quick-tempered. He's slow to anger. And abounding in mercy. See, it's talking about grace and mercy here. Mercy keeps you from receiving something you do deserve, but grace gives you something in life, rewards you with something you don't deserve. See, now Jesus took uh, what we do deserve to the cross, paid the price for it, and ended it. But then in his resurrection, in the grace of God, the abundant grace of God we looked at in the last series, now we're receiving abundant grace, favors from God, blessings from God, healing and wholeness in our life that we didn't deserve at all. It's all unmerited favor. So he says in verse 9, he, is not always, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Now he's referring to the fact that his anger was poured out on Jesus on the cross. We're not under the wrath and the anger of God anymore. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 9 and 10 says this new covenant that God gave an oath, just like the waters of Noah, that he would never be angry with us nor rebuke us ever again, never condemn us. Why? Because it was all exhausted when Jesus went to the cross. Verse 10, 
He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Right there, that undoes, undoes, is that a word? That really kind of overturns a lot of that, I got out of that, overturns a lot of that uh, convenient idea that God uses sickness and disease in our life today, or allows it, in order to punish us from some kind of wrongdoing in our life. Notice right here, that's not what this says. This is the Word of God. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. He didn't deal with us according to our sins. He dealt with Jesus on the cross according to our sins as our substitute. Nor has He punished us according to your iniquities. That's the mercy of God in our life. Not receiving punishment that was due to us that we do deserve, but receiving freedom that we don't deserve. Verse 11 says, For as the heavens are higher than the, above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him or trust in him for salvation. Verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. See, that, that parallels what we just read over in Isaiah 53, verse number 4, that he carried our pains. That means to carry off to a distance. Notice, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. In other words, God's never going to revisit those. He's never going to bring those back up, never going to bring those back into our life again. And listen, you shouldn't either. You shouldn't go fishing for those things. And you shouldn't allow the enemy to start playing those videotapes of your past. Why? Because all those old things passed away. You're a brand new creation in Christ. You are in Christ. You are blameless and holy in his sight, Colossians 1 says. And notice, he is, as so far as he removed our transgressions from us. We can say this, that as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed sickness, disease, and infirmity from us. When you see that Jesus dealt with sin, how he forgave all of our sins, always keep that in the back of your mind that he's also dealing with the effects of sin, which is sickness, disease, and infirmity that we have healing and wholeness legally, legally. It legally belongs to us because of the finished work of Jesus. See, don't let the enemy talk you out that you have a legal right to receive healing under this redemptive work and this new covenant in Christ. Well, that's all the time I've got for this lesson. We're gonna pick up here in the next one. Join us again then. If you'd like additional materials, go to TonyCowan.org. We'll see you in the next lesson. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. We hope that it really blessed you. Hope you got a lot out of it. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you also turn on the notifications so that you get notified whenever we post a new video. Also, go ahead and hit that like button. And if God's doing awesome things in your life like we're believing Him for, then we would love for you to share that with us. So leave us a comment. Let us know all the good things God's doing in your life. We'll see you next time.